I would like to start with uh, thanking the organizers for uh, arranging this special session where we can honor uh, Brenda uh, Milner being in this field for 65 years and opening the doors so that we all can start to understand more of the functions of the hippocampal system. This is Brenda when you visited us in uh, Trondheim in 2014. It was so fantastic to have you as a visitor. And it has been fantastic that you started this field. So already in the 50s, you worked together with Scoville, the surgeon, and you have probably heard already now so many stories from this, from, from Lynn talking about AGM and so on. So I don't want to go into the details, but what I would like to say to you is that thank you for pointing to the importance of the hippocampus and what kind of functions the hippocampus could have. So when AGM had to um, allow that uh, Scoville would remove the hippocampus and some of the surrounding cortex, and he was left with some functions that uh, were uh, disabled. And you pointed to not only those functions, but importantly, you said, look, he also has some functions that are not disabled. You described it so beautifully in the paper in 57 and in many, many other papers in the 50 years that you studied uh, HM. But this is a, a citation from uh, your paper where you described how he could not find his way to the bathroom from his room. And it was like he had met people for the first time, even though he had met you and others so many times. And this is what we call, of course, episodic memory the information about what happened where. And in order to study the cells that contribute to this function, we think that the contribution of rodent studies are important. And this is a, a rodent brain, and you see here the hippocampus in green, looking quite different from the uh, hippocampus that you see in, in the humans. John O'Keefe came from McGill, like you, Brenda, and he came with your ideas and brought them to London. And he was so curious about trying to understand what is this hippocampus doing? And in order to address this question, he put sensors into the hippocampus of a rat that was happily running around chasing honey rice. And then he observed the behavior of the animal and he listened to single cells from the hippocampus. And then he asked himself, what are these cells signaling? And here you listen to such a cell and you hear pop, 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 pop. And this cell that uh, we illustrate here is active in the northwest corner. And this we also see here in the rate map plot uh, where the hot colors is where the cell is very active, and blue colors and cold colors where the cell uh, is not active at all. Importantly, when you record many cells at the same time, like John did and others following him, then, uh, and uh, if, you, if you come close to 100, for example, then you can predict the location of the animal with a precision of around five centimeters. And this information, these observations, led then John O'Keefe to suggest that these cells, they code for the location of the animal, and he decided to call these cells place cells. And together with Lynn, Lynn Nadel, he wrote this famous book where they brought Tolman's ideas into neuroscience, the idea about the cognitive map, exactly what happens where. And then 
used the information they had got from John's and others' studies to suggest what the hippocampus is doing and how. Beautiful, beautiful book. Thank you. So Edward and I, Edward Molson and I, we were so lucky that we were allowed to go to John O'Keefe's lab and learn this technique from him. So we learned to record places. And of course, the big question at that time was, is it so that this information about location or the where signal, is that generated within the hippocampus itself? And you have to know that um, the hippocampus is uh, a, a road of information coming from the entrinal cortex and then going to C3 and up to C1 and then back to the entrinal cortex again. And we, we asked the question, is it so that it has to, the information has to go through this loop, uh, this trisynaptic loop, in order to have um, the place information that John discovered? In order to address that question, we made lesions so that we blocked uh, the information coming from entorhinal cortex through the trisynaptic circuit and up to C1. What we discovered then is that the cells uh, in C1 still had uh, the signal, the location of the animal. That led us to another structure, the upstream structure of the hippocampus and the upstream structure of C1, the entorhinal cortex. And we know that entorhinal cortex provides the strongest cortical input to the hippocampus and also uh, will give some head direction input to, to these cells. To the right here you see uh, the, the brain, uh, the rat brain, and with the colorful area that is the entorhinal cortex. And uh, down to the right you see the human brain and with the corresponding colors, red is the hippocampus and blue is the entorhinal cortex. So what happened when we recorded, like John did in the hippocampus, when we recorded in the entorhinal cortex? Look, this cell is just so amazing. This shows the path of the animal in the black traces and the blue dots, one single blue dot is the action potential of the cell. So this is the pattern of one cell when the animal is running around chasing chocolate. What you see here is that this is such a regular pattern. It's tessellating the whole environment. And it's so precise that we can fit in equilateral triangles into this pattern. So we think that this cell might function as a coordinate system uh, for uh, the animal to find its way in the environment. And we also suggest that it was a universal coordinate system because this pattern you will see whatever environment the animal is traversing. What is also very interesting about this cell is that it comes in different resolutions. So the most dorsal grid cell has very small fields and small distance between the fields and then as you go further ventral, you see that it's like blowing up a balloon and you have drawn the grid cell on and you see that it's expanding, the fields are expanding and the distance expands. If you align these cells on top of each other, the, the activity of them, and you sum up simple linear summation, then you get one field like we had in the hippocampus. The place cell. So, and we also know that this is information that is going to uh, the individual cells in the hippocampus. So at least this is uh, some of the information that the place cells receives, and we think that that is important for the place signal that we see. But we also know, of course, that there are other type of information that these cells receive. Another thing that uh, surprised us so much is when this, these cells 
live so deep in the brain, so far away from the sensory input? How can it still uh, behave so perfect to be active at this precise pattern? We taught that this cell needs information about the direction of the animal and also the speed, because the speed is changing all the time when the animal is running around. Is that true? Already in 2006, we had a postdoc here, Francesca Sargolini, and she recorded cells close to the grid cells, and uh, she showed beautifully uh, uh, such head direction cells that was already dis uh, described uh, by Rank and, and Taube in the Dorsal Presubiculum. Another type of uh, cells was discovered in our lab by Emilio Krupp when he trained animals driving a car. And the point with that was to, to check when the animal is driving at different speeds, is it so that the cell would also change its firing rate uh, with the speed of the animal? And that happened uh, when, the car, uh, when, when the animal was driving, but it also happened when the animal was running around spontaneously in uh, the open field. And that is what you see here in this slide. You see the, the, the rate maps and also you see that if you plot the activity of the cell as a function of the speed of the animal, you see there is a beautiful, beautiful linear uh, function. So that means that speed cells that we decided to call these cells, they change their activity uh, depending on the speed of the animal. And all this information is then given to the grid cell so that the grid cell can fire as precise as we have seen today. So, so far I've described uh, how cells respond in a very boring environment. But of course, we know that the environments are not as in the lab or even lab environments can be more enriched than just an open black box with a cue card at one wall. And in order to explore, is it so that entorhinal cortex can code what happens where, as we have seen in that is important for episodic memory, we had some um, PhD students in the lab and led them, especially by Eivind uh, Heydal, addressing these questions. And in order to address this question, we have to also uh, think about what kind of behavior data exist in the literature. We have heard from Colette that when they tested the response to towers in the environment, and if the animal could use these towers in order to locate food, they showed that in this paper that I just borrowed this figure from. So they trained and they trained the animal with two towers and with food in between. And then at the test day, they moved the towers and then they asked, where would the animal search for food? Where the food was located in the training phase? or uh, in a distance that was uh, relying on uh, where the uh, towers were. And that is exactly what happened, as you see here in this figure, that, um, that this, the animals, they were searching at a certain distance and direction away from these towers. So we asked then, do we have cells that really calculate this in the brain and respond to the distance and the direction of different objects. In order to address that question, then uh, Eivind and uh, Emilia and Sebastian, they had mice running around in the environment and they put in Duplo towers. And then they were just recording from entorhinal cortex and asking, do we see some cells that would code for uh, the distance and the direction to these objects. And when there was no object, there was no activity in such cells, but when there is an object, 
then these cells would be active and some cells would be active to the left of the object and some cells to the right of the object and some with uh, uh, short distance and some with long distance. And that is uh, <coughs> what is so interesting here is also, of course, that when you move uh, the object, then you see that the field is moving. And this is just to sum up uh, this figure here to show that all directions towards the object were represented in different cells and uh, many distances, even though uh, most cells prefer the distance between the animal and the object of around 15 centimeters. So uh, we have then shown that uh, uh, such object vector cells uh, exist in the entorhinal cortex. Then we asked, is it so that these cells are picky? Do they respond to any object? And uh, here is a, a, a figure showing that, yes, they respond to any object. So cell 2, for example, was exposed to two objects. And you see it has uh, fields to both objects, to the, to the left and at a certain distance. And uh, you see the different cells responding to the different objects and the objects are then uh, shown in white circles. So it seems like these cells, they are able to um, uh, signal the direction and distance to any object in the environment. However, are there limits to this universal response to object? Is it so that if the object is too small, or too wide? Do we see the same response or do we see a response? And that is uh, what Avin addressed in this experiment. And it seems like the cells responded to any object, even though uh, we had very narrow cylinders and very wide cylinders. The next question that we wanted to address was, is it so that these objects, they have to block the path of the animal, or is it enough just to see them? And then Avin would hang up the object above the head of the mouse and then ask, is it so that these cells would then signal uh, the vector towards these uh, objects? And what you see here is that when the object is standing, you see the same response as when the object is hanging. For those who are curious and know about our border cells that we have also uh, shown in, in entorhinal cortex, those cells that would respond to borders, they would not be active when the object was hanging, only when the object was blocking the path of the animal. And we also asked, what about the, 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 the signal to, to noise or the figure uh, and the background? Do these objects, do they need to be 3D in order to elicit this response? And here you see an example of such experiments. And to the left you see that uh, the 3D object uh, elicited the response uh, when you pushed the 3D object further into the wall, it still had the same response. And when you align the object with the wall so that it was suddenly a 2D um, object, then uh, you still get the response. So it doesn't need to stand out as a 3D object from uh, the surrounding background in order to elicit the response. So until now, we have been uh, asking about objects that are uh, stationary. But we know that there's so many objects surrounding us that would move. A ball, uh, when you have a soccer game, uh, people are passing us in the corridor, whatever. And then the question is, one thing is for these cells to develop vectors towards stationary objects. What happens? if the object is moving? And this question was addressed again by Avin. He developed a robot driving around in the environment 
with the mouse chasing or running around, chasing both food, but also running after the, the, the robot. And then he asked, do we see the same object vector response as we see to stationary objects? So here is an example of one cell to the left. You see the stationary object, you see the path of the animal, you see the rate plot, and you also see uh, a direction uh, of the field uh, and the distance of the field. When the stationary object is, then you see that uh, uh, everything is, is, is quite constant. But when the object is moving, you see that the rate map of these object vector cells is messy, but they keep the direction and the distance to this moving object. What about the grid cell? Grid cells do not respond uh, much to objects in the environment. And they don't care that much about the moving objects. So you see that the rate map look beautiful even though uh, the object is moving around, the robot is running. And this is uh, summed up in the next figure. And to the left, you see the correlation of the different rate maps in the OV cells and the object vector cells. And that is quite low when the object is moving, but it's quite high when the uh, object is moving for the grid cells. So the grid cells don't care uh, uh, about a uh, uh, movement of the object. But when you come to how well they code the distance to the object and the direction uh, that we see here on the right uh, curve, then you see that the object vector cells they have a very high correlation, but not the grid cells. So it seems like grid cells, they keep track of the environment, but the object vector cells, they keep track of objects, either stationary or if they're even moving. So far, we have demonstrated that there is a jungle of cells in the entorhinal cortex and I have, haven't even told you about all the extraordinary fun uh, findings that we have from the entorhinal cortex. But I have shown to you that there are cells in the entorhinal cortex giving information to the hippocampus both about space and about object about what is where. But until now, we have talked about single cells and very few single cells. The future in our lab and in other people's lab is to record many, many cells at the same time so that you can decode, is there an object? Where is the animal? Do you see the same maps when the animal is sleeping? And so on. And is that possible? Yes, it is possible. So I would like to introduce two techniques. I'm not going to give you, uh, give you much data from this, but I just want to tell you that these techniques exist we are able to use these techniques and the future looks bright, bright using these techniques. This is an example of the NeuroPixel probe and that has many, many channels, more than uh, 300 channels. Uh, and, and you can then record thousands of cells, as you see here from entorhinal cortex and Richard Garner uh, is the one who, who worked on this in our lab and is still working. And the recordings are just gorgeous. There's another technique that was started uh, 
uh, or introduced to our lab uh, by Wei Zhang Song. And this technique is that it's possible to reduce a two photon microscope and reduce it to two grams so that the animal is able to run around in the environment while we are looking at the cells. And in this way, we can also study thousands of cells at the same time when we understand the functions, where they are in the structure, how they interact with each other. So this, as I said, this is the future and this is so fun and so interesting data that we get, we get out of uh, with these new techniques. So thank you, Brenda, for pointing to the hippocampus and the hippocampal formation. You started it and you are still working on it. And I think that the future looks bright for all of us when it comes to understanding the cells and the functions in these structures. So thank you so much to both Brenda and to all of you. And the last slide is just to say thank you to the people who have been involved and especially Edward Moser who has been of course involved in, in all of this and also the people that I have mentioned during this talk and I have also listed all the organizations that support us with resources. So thank you all and good luck with all new information and studies that we're going to get in the future.